This episode is brought to you by Fortis et Fidelis, honoring the brave and faithful service of our fallen. The free will never forget. Are you interested in creating your own podcast? If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First, it's free. Secondly, there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So what are you waiting for? Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey everyone, Raiden here. And if you haven't heard, we were recently named one of the top 25 military veteran hosted podcasts by Podcast Magazine. And I just want to take this time to thank you all for your support, not only with this podcast, but also in supporting our brand, Fortis et Fidelis, and in helping us create and provide memorial coins for families of the fallen. So I appreciate y'all. Till then, enjoy this episode. Thanks. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Brave and Faithful Podcast. I'm your host, Redden Dionisio. And today I have with us Harrison Johnson. Harrison is an Army veteran. Uh, and he's also the Director of Operations for the FitOps Foundation. Harrison, what's going on, bro? Not much. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, like I said, thanks for taking the time and uh, for you to share a little bit about your story. Um, before we get started uh, in what you're doing now, can you share a little bit about you know your service and um, how how that was? Yeah. So I I just actually just got out uh, in February of this year officially. Uh, I spent ten years in the Army Infantry and spent first few minus a 12 13 month deployment uh in the middle but the first few years up in alaska at fort wainwright spent the middle chunk five or so years in fort campbell the 101st and then the last couple as a drill sergeant before i had the opportunity to transition out and get involved with fit ops uh deployed twice had a you know honestly a really really good experience in the service um but slowly, as as the time went along, kind of came to the conclusion that I, I got what I wanted and what I was searching for from my time in uniform. And n- no, really didn't feel like I was adding to from, you know, in my opinion, I was, I was starting to take from who I was and from my family and my kids. And at that point, I realized I, you know, got what I came for and wanted to focus on something else in life and decided to get out and, you know, cross paths with Matt Hesse and got an opportunity to get involved with FitOps. It's awesome, man. So, you know, before we get into uh, FitOps, um, what would you say was kind of like your biggest takeaway from, from the military and how did that prepare you and your, you know, and what you're doing now? You know, I, I turned a lot of my thoughts about the service into almost like adages as I was, a, when I was a drill sergeant, you know, you get, you get short frames of time to connect with the young privates and the new generation of soldiers coming through. And I always talked about the the army values. I'm sure all the branches have some sort of value system that they hammer into you as you, you grow up in the, in uniform, but in the army, there's seven values and I won't bore you with them, but they're pretty typical values uh, whether you're a religious person, faithful, or you just simply believe in being a good human, none of them are surprising. But I would tell my privates, like, hey, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you came from. And I don't care what values you brought to the table. Because I'm going to issue seven army values to each, of one, each, each and every one of you. And as long as you live your life in uniform by those seven army values, 90% of the time you'll be you'll be right with the decisions you're making. And the rest of the time comes through, you know, training and muscle memory when it comes to making decisions in uniform. But I think the, 
the biggest thing I came, I took from my service and try to take into life is that veterans are all bound by this inherent camaraderie and this community and family. And we're, we're just spectacular, uh, contributors, contributors to the civilian landscape and workforce. Right. But we're, we have a hard time translating them and we have a hard time figuring out how to repurpose ourselves. And we think that all of a sudden we're in a, in a new world, not surrounded by that community, that inherent family that uniform brings and we can't figure out what to do. So I think, you know, what I, what I took from service was a new set of standards and values, uh, work ethic and teamwork and, you know, really, I think realized over the last year or so of transitioning out that everything I learned in, in service and in uniform can be translated really, really effectively into civilian work. It's just, you know, rewiring yourself to do so. So it's, it's been an exciting, uh, path I've been on, but, uh, I'm just getting started. Yeah, I, I love how you uh, you mentioned in the beginning. I'm gonna issue you these seven you know, core values, and 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 from there, you know, you you'll you'll succeed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like you get guys guys and girls from every corner of the earth, you know, and legitimately all over the world. Citizenship citizenship through service, you know, privates coming in from everywhere. So you get this awesome cross section of uh, how diverse the world is at basic training and you get, you know, you get a lot of troublemakers, you get some good kids, you get extremely religious kids, but it really didn't matter. Like you just, you, you swipe the slate clean and you take young privates and you, you teach them things. So, you know, drop what you had, leave it at the door and give you everything you need to survive and to succeed in the army. And, you know, I think that's, it, it's, ref, I think that's one of the, the things people think of when they, you know, they hear, oh, you're a veteran. That's awesome. I think what people, what fires in people's minds is like, is those, that basic set of values. They assume that all veterans are inherently good people because they've had those values, you know, slammed into their heads for sometimes decades. Right. And so, you know, when we look left and right, you know, even you and I, we've never met. I know that you, you know, have a certain set of values and that I can inherently trust you because you wore the uniform and, and you believed in something bigger than yourself and you selflessly served your country and the people of it. So I think, you know, those values and upholding those values, especially post serve post transition is a big deal to winning this, this battle of veterans versus the civilian world. Right. I mean, and it goes without saying there, there's just somebody and there's just something about somebody who, you know, uh, raises their, their right hand and, you know, you know, prompts us to defend the, the country, you know, whether that costs them their life, if it costs them their life or not, you know. Um, and and I think a lot of people out there, they have the, um, they look at veterans and they know that for the most part, they can, they can do the job and they can be trusted, so. Right. Yep. Um so talking about your transition, I know you kind of just mentioned you you just got out uh, of the army this year, and then you basically just found uh, what I like to call your second service. You you know you you were introduced to fit ops, and um, how, how did that how did that come about? I know you kind of mentioned earlier you were introduced to Matt. Like how did, yeah. how did you come to the you know the position where you at right now? So it's, it's an amazing, it, honestly, it's a too good to be true story kind of thing. And, and in this, in this job and, and in fit ops, we, we say this is, you know, it's unbelievable. It's too good to be true. Stars are aligning. We say that all the time, but I think that, you know, what I believe is that good energy and true purpose, those things cause people to gravitate towards each other. And so while I don't think anything's too good to be true, but the story so I decided to get out. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my life in service and out of service uh, surrounded by uh, suicide and mental health struggles. Uh, I was fortunate enough to not struggle personally a lot with it. Uh, I think most veterans 
struggle with mental health in some capacity and myself included, but suicide was never an option for me because I think, you know, people around me were choosing it and I, it never processed with me. And I just could never imagine getting down that road myself. Uh, so instead of, you know, continuing to question it, I wanted to get involved and, and try to give back to the community that was struggling around me. So I decided to get out and I had some connections at the state of Arkansas and actually got approved and uh, released from service so that I could participate in the skills bridge program with the army and do an, do an internship. And I was approved to be the first uh, military intern with the, the governor of Arkansas. And my intention and my sales pitch was really vague, but the, my sales pitch was, I wanted to find, build and bring veteran support organizations to the state of Arkansas uh, with the mission of you know, growing the mental health initiative in the state and supporting our veterans. So I, I got approved for that. I started the process of getting out and through a service connection, um, I'm sure, I think you've actually had him on the podcast, but Eric Bartel, yeah. uh, who is the executive bire- director of the FitOps Foundation, he, he and I worked together. We were in the same unit back at Fort Campbell. And when FitOps came to Arkansas and they needed it. They wanted to hold a camp in Arkansas. Eric, remember that I was from Northwest Arkansas. So Eric reached out and asked me for some help and I got involved and, you know, eventually I, you know, crossed paths with Matt and had my opportunity to kind of throw an elevator pitch at him. And I was, you know, I, I looked at it at the time and I still look at that conversation I had with Matt Hesse on the phone as that was my shot. Mm-hmm. I knew what I wanted to do. I had this vision of, you know, like I said, building and, and growing veteran support organizations. I had this true like desire to really give back and continue in a second service, as you call it, uh, to, to men and women in uniform. And then I met FitOps through Eric and then met Matt through FitOps. And I had my opportunity to say, this is what I wanted to do. And this is what I thought I could bring to the table. So I helped run uh, a camp in Northwest Arkansas, which was John Cena's first camp. And our first camp interacting with Walmart, who's become a big partner with us, and helped throw that camp together. It was kind of a time crunch, but uh, we got it done. And then I slowly kind of earned my spot on the team and got hired on as the director of operations and uh, continued to grow with my relationship with Matt and the organization. And now I'm running the team here in Northwest Arkansas. We just got some office space. We've uh, purchased 450 acres here in Northwest Arkansas, where we're going to build our our home base, Camp Fit Ops, mm. and uh, start running things on our own. And uh, it's it's been an amazing, you know, 12 months or so. Uh, I guess it's almost a year and a half now that I've worked with the organization. But that's how I got introduced, and you know, we've got a lot of work ahead. But it's, it doesn't feel like work when when your heart's in it. So yeah, most definitely, and. Um... You know, I, I went through the uh, fit ops class when it was back in Texas. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Eric and Matt, uh, Matt came down and kind of just shared his story. Um, it was, you know, they're, they're, they're awesome. They're awesome guys. Um, obviously with Matt has created with fit ops and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's a great foundation. So, yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, Eric's moved on. He's doing bigger things over at Bravo Sierra. Right. Um, and Matt and I are running the team now. And I think it's changed a lot. And naturally, I think I, w- I would call it a, a pretty hard, hard startup when you probably went through in Dallas where, you know, I don't think anyone realized the potential or the the uh, scale in which FitOps could grow or really saw the direction in which it was going to grow. And I can say pretty definitively that at the beginning, it was specifically designed to bring veterans together and give them purpose through fitness by certifying them as personal trainers. Right. right? That's, that's what you experienced and realized pretty quickly. And I'm sure you saw, saw some of it, uh, but realized pretty quickly the power of community and a healthy mind and body that, and what that brought to the veteran population. And so the, 
the mission and the foundation has evolved, you know, I can't even describe how much it's evolved, but we've got people coming. We've got, I think, 10 people on the team now, uh, a lot more focus on the, the mental health side, a lot more definition within the curriculum and education side. And uh, but the brand itself is growing extremely fast and it's it's really exciting. Yeah, it's, it's great to see the like in this short amount of time, you know, I think I was like the fourth class to uh, what is it now? Like 10th or. Yeah, we're on, uh, we graduated 10 classes. So yeah. we would be at 15 had, had right. our lovely friend Corona not come in and spoiled the party. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, that's a great segue to it. Um, you know, talking about your second service with FitOps, um, you know, how has that been with what's been going on in 2020 and COVID and things like that? Can you talk talk a little bit more about like the challenges you guys have faced and what what have you guys done to overcome those those challenges? Yeah, I think you know I everyone got to the point. Yeah, you know, I think everyone hated COVID. I think there was some denial, and then there was the acceptance phase where we all hated COVID, and then we kind of moved into this. Well, there was a little bit of a silver lining almost, and for FitOps, it was the same way. You know, we were. 2020 was slated to be our biggest year. We were going to have five camps. We were going to double the population of CVFOs. And, you know, it was really my first year where I was in control. I was, I was, you know, I had something to be really proud of and work towards operationally. And then boom, it was over and I was pissed. Right. And then it was like, okay, well, wait, this is a huge opportunity to really focus and evolve and redefine some of the things that, uh, that we needed to work on as a team. And so we, we, you know, we hunkered down and we said, we, we kind of defined what verticals within the organization needed to be worked on and emphasized. And it also gave us an opportunity to, you know, save some of that money we were going to spend on running five camps and pushing out about 300 more CVFOs and focus on getting our camp built. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you saw some of the pains that a nomadic structure brought to the table down in Dallas. You know, when you when you're not at, in your house, it's hard to control the environment. And right. um, so we we stepped back. We said, OK, what can we do better? And the first thing was, how do we continue the growth that the veterans experience at camp? How do we continue that growth post graduation? So we brought on Johnny Martin who's our director of aftercare. Uh, he's got 20 years of counseling experience, trauma, trauma coaching. And so he's really the, you know, the, the mental health guy now at camp, but his direct focus is starting that growth at camp and continuing it post-graduation. So that was a big push we've had. And you've probably seen some of the emails coming through, but there's a lot more emphasis put on continuing that connective tissue growth post-graduation now. Um, and then we brought in a guy named Nate Palin, uh, who's got over a decade of experience within the Ranger Regiment and then, uh, the NSCA works with X Exos for a while, but he's kind of the front runner in building tactical certifications within the fitness industry. And so we brought him on as our director of education and he's building out a completely unique and comprehensive certification program that will only be found at FitOps. Mm. And then Matt and I got to work on getting land and building, you know, what we call our Taj Mahal uh, and our University of Health and Performance at Camp FitOps in Northwest Arkansas. So, you know, once we stopped being pissed, we realized what an opportunity it was to really take a step back, look at the organi organization fix some things, improve some things and grow some things. So I'll leave it at that. But uh, 2020 was always going to be our biggest year yet. And it, it definitely has been. Right. It's a challenge. But, uh, you know, you, you guys kind of, like you said, kind of just stepped back and kind of figured out what else can we improve on yep. despite this uh, pandemic, this COVID that's going on around the world. So, yep. Um. Is there anything that you kind of want to put out there for like 2021 or like your future plans or anything like that? Yeah. Um, so as I said, we we're in the development of our, our camp um, and we're, you know, 
we've kicked it as as fast as we can. So our hope is obviously that once, I mean, I'll, I'll be transparent and for those listening uh, and curious as to when we're going to hold our next camp. It's, it's very, it's a delicate situation. Um, you know, I, I think that the majority of veterans, especially the ones that have applied and been accepted into the, the fit ops uh, camps and then had to be pushed off. I, I, I'm sure I'm confident that most of them would hop on a plane tomorrow and come to camp. But the right. problem is, is that it is twice as expensive to run a camp and to do it safely right now. And as safe as we could potentially make it, all it would take is one little hiccup or one person getting COVID and all of the efforts would be worth it would be pointless and it would be a media nightmare. It wouldn't be a good look. And so what we've decided on is really just pumping the brakes and holding our first camp at our home at camp fit ops in Northwest Arkansas when it's ready and when it's right. Uh, so we will host camps in 2021 and we plan to do that as soon as possible, late spring, um, at the, at the latest, I would say probably early summer will be our first camp. And then once we open those doors, it'll be a continuous pipeline of camps back to back to back until we can catch up on the almost 1200 people that have applied for fit ops, um, and are, are patiently waiting in line. So you'll see that. You'll see a couple of new um, education opportunities potentially uh, designed, not potentially, but they're going to be designed in, to attract the graduates like you to come back for additional certifications. So there'll be new versions of Camp Fit Ops where you can come back and continue your education, almost uh, almost like a degree plan, if, if, if you understand what I'm saying, where you can sure. continue to add on to that basic training, personal trainer certification course that we run uh, and that you experienced. So there's a lot, a lot going on and a lot of excitement, but uh, 2021 will be a big year and we'll, we'll definitely be opening the doors to our new home. That's awesome. That's great to hear, man. And uh, that'd be great to come back. And for those that are, you know, listening that might have applied for the class and, and waiting. There you go. There you have it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We're going to make it happen. Don't worry. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, man. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we talked about the challenges that you guys have faced. <clears throat> what's been, since, you know, being with FitOps, what's been, you know, the most rewarding experience you've had so far? You know, I, I don't, uh, I'm not selfish very often, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and be selfish with this most rewarding moment. Um, you know, when I got out of the, I got out of the army, I was, I was enlisted. Um, so, you know, as far as the demographic that needs the most help transitioning, I was definitely a part of that. You know, we don't, we're not college educated, like the officer side of the house. You know, we don't, I was in the infantry. So probably the least marketable, uh, job, post service that you can have, you know, uh, unless someone needs someone to walk up and down the street and kick doors down. Uh, I don't, don't really have a lot of tangible skills. Um, but it was the most terrifying thing ever. I'm a, I'm a husband. I have two little boys. I decided to give up on job security and, and get out of the military. It's terrifying. I didn't know for the first time in a decade, if I could, you know, provide for my family. And, and then, you know, I'm getting into the nonprofit world, which is volatile as it is. Uh, but I believed in what I was doing and I believed in myself to an extent, but when I decided to get out, I had to prove to myself so that I could do it so that I could prove to others that they could do it. Right. right. Uh, and it's, it will always be my selfish hope that I set the example for a lot of my buddies uh, that are still back in uniform that simply don't believe that they can get out and be successful. So I think the most rewarding part, part of transitioning out for me was getting the job and being successful and feeling successful and, you know, doing it on my own terms. You know what I mean? So, you know, there was nothing more rewarding than seeing the first group of CVFOs walk across the first camp that I, that I did and, and watching camp run, run, smoothly and flawlessly that was it was awesome 
Um, but, you know, feeling like I got out and I did it and I, I made it, that was rewarding because I knew what that would lead to uh, for others and, and for this organization. If, you know, if I could do it, I know anyone can do it. And I just have to be that kind of almost beacon for hope for a lot of those enlisted guys sitting back in the uniform, not happy. You know, at the end of the day, they're truly not happy. They'll, they'll keep signing that line because it's the easy, smart thing to do, right? It's easier to just re-enlist. Yeah. It's not, there's no risk involved, right? right. You're going you're gonna to keep getting that paycheck, get that free health care. Uh, but are you happy at the end of the day? And I wasn't. Yeah. And I took the chance and I made it happen. And I, I hope to set the example for a lot of the guys that are questioning whether they can do it or not. So, yeah. And then just, I mean, just being a positive influence and positive example, like you said, right. for others, others to follow. That's all I want to be. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so, for our audience just joining us now, uh, talking to Harrison Johnson. He's the uh, director of operations for FitOps Foundation. Um, so, Harrison, can you give our audience one actionable step that they can take right now in pursuit of their second service? Yeah, I would say, you know, something you don't really get the ability to do in in uniform is sit down and ask yourself, what makes you happy? Uh, because in the army, it, it really doesn't matter what makes you happy or in the military, you know, you have to wake up zero six, whether you're happy about it or not, you put on the uniform, go to PT and rest and recycle and repeat the next day. You know, you, you, you know what you're doing, you're going to do it anyway, but in your second service, and as you transition out, you finally have the opportunity to sit back and say, what makes me happy? And right. I think that leads to finding your purpose in life. And if you know what your purpose is and you can reflect effectively enough to find that purpose and to find out what makes you happy, then you'll never work a day in your life. And if everybody did that and everyone sat down and really figured out what made them happy, you know, our mission of solving the veteran suicide epidemic it would be a non-factor. Everyone would be happy. There wouldn't be suicide because we were all purpose-driven, hardworking, happy individuals. So I, you know, I challenge everyone to ask themselves is what you are doing, uh, is where you're doing it, is who you're doing it around, uh, making you happy and, and filling your life with purpose. And if not, maybe it's time to take a risk and make a change like I did. Yeah. So what, Going to, to your point, why do you think um, why do you think sometimes it's difficult for people to find that you know what makes them happy? Like what, like for example, people you know the, the active duty guys, like you said before, it's easier if they you know just reenlist or or sign and uh, sign for another reenlistment. Um, is it just because they don't want to? it seems like they're comfortable, right? It seems like people are more comfortable and rather not be uncomfortable. in, in, in those yeah. situations. I mean, like, I, I think it, sometimes it's counterintuitive to make the, make a decision uh, based on what makes you happy. You know what I mean? It's not always the, the easy decision. It's definitely not always the financially responsible decision, but in the army, I think the hardest, the hardest thing for people to, to fig not to figure out but something that's really hard for people is that thing i've talked about earlier is translating your skills you know in the military you get on your your military records and depending on your branch you pick you print out some sort of records brief right your your resume your you know in the army it's an erb your enlisted records brief and quite simply it's in black and white and it tells you exactly what your value is in uniform. It shows all your medals, all your schools, all your competency scores, everything about you is summarized in an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And you never have to question what your value is. There's no, you know, the, the, there's no left and right. There's no wiggle room. It's simply 
printed on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. You know exactly who you are and you can hand that to anyone in the army and they're going to know exactly who you are. And there's no arguing it. Uh, and all of a sudden you decide you want to get out and it's scary because you don't know how to translate that. And at the end of the day, look, the army, the military, they're an employer and they invest a lot of money into every soldier, sailor, Marine, uh, air, airman, you know, they invest a lot of money into training these guys. It, it it doesn't make sense for them to also invest into uh, convincing you to get out and be successful. I get that, right, right. but there's no effort put to put into it whatsoever. And like, I, I think people struggle because it is, it's, it's easy. You know exactly who you are because the army makes it easy. The military makes it easy for you to know exactly what your value is in uniform. Right. And right whether it's the badges on the chat on your chest or the rank on your chest or your collar, you know exactly who you are. You don't have to convince anyone. There's no question. And here out here, I mean, uh, I, I laughed yesterday. I was doing some demo work at our new fit ops office and I was in like a Carhartt hoodie. I was some old multicam torn up pants and some, my old combat boots. I looked like, I looked like a, a construction worker and someone was coming out of the, the office space uh, from a different tenant and they bumped into me and they were really rude. And yeah. I think, you know, I think they assumed I was, uh, if, you know, I was in their space. I was in the you know construction space and I just brushed it off. And later on that day, I'd gone home, gotten dressed, put on a fit ops polo and went back and I saw that same person. Um, you know, that never happens in the army, right? You never, you never bump into someone and not know who they are. You, they, their uniform tells, tells you everything they need to know. Um, and it's just a, it's a scary world to step out of something you're so accustomed to and comfortable with. Uh, and to even more so, you know, leave behind all of the people that you know understand that. Like in uniform, like I talked about before, you know everyone to your left and right understands exactly what they're doing there understands the same value system i mean i'm not saying you can trust everyone to your left and right in uniform i mean <laughs> I'd, I'd show up to work sometimes in my locker and be cleaned out because everyone stole all my stuff like but that's the military <laughs> um <laughs> but it's scary leaving all that behind and there's nothing done by the military to prepare you uh for all of those voids that are created taking the uniform off you know what i mean so yeah, you just got to find, like we always talk about, like you got to find your second service, your your next mission in life. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and I think the more, yeah, I, I talked about, I talked about how successful my transition is. And I, I, I credit some of that because to the fact I found a veteran organization, you know, I, I didn't have to rewire as much as some people do. You know what I mean? Like right. I'm still surrounded by veterans. So surrounded by people that I know believe in the same things I do. Um, so mine was a successful and easy transition, but yeah, it's, it's sometimes difficult to find your second service, but the closer you can get, uh, the less things you have to change, the easier it'll be. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, Harrison, what's one thing you want our audience to take away from this episode? Um, I'm going to steal something from our director of aftercare, Johnny Martin, um, who if he's not a veteran himself, but if you ever want a really entertaining podcast um, for a guy that only works with veterans, get Johnny Martin on here. He'll entertain everyone that listens. <laughs> but uh, he talks a lot and we talk a lot about the difference between empowerment and entitlement. And right. I, one of my favorite quotes, and I'll, I, I love this and you can steal it and you can pass it around, but one of my favorite quotes, and it's my quote, um, so give me credit, but the worst soldier makes the best veteran. And I'm using soldier and veteran in very like stereotypical ways. But when I say the best veteran, I talk, I'm talking about the guy that is walking down the road and you know, a hundred feet away, that guy's a veteran. 
He's got yeah, like yeah. a enduring freedom veteran hat on. He's got cut off <laughs> yeah. multi cam shorts. He's covered in tattoos. He's got yeah. a big dip in, and you're like, that guy's a veteran. Right. And then I'm, when I say the worst soldier, I mean the kid that wanted nothing to do with being in the military. He complained the whole time. He hated it. And then the second he gets out, all he wants is credit for his service. And all I wanted to do as like a 10-year a NCO is say, you know, you sucked the whole time you were in the service. Why do you get credit for being a veteran now? But, I, you know, I, they're obviously – they still served. Um, right. But what I want people to think about is something I talk about all the time. Veterans that primarily – identify as a veteran for example they start sentences with well as a veteran i no look everyone needed and i think this is part and i talk about this occasionally but i think this is part of why i was successful in transitioning and you know really figured out how to use my service as a tool in the real world is i had a plan i was 22 when i went to basic training um I'd been to college. I'd you know, already tried and failed at, at normal life a few times. And I had always looked from day one in the military as my time in service was going to be a tool to make me a better civilian. And that's what I encourage people to look at. Um, I, I, I look at yourself as a civilian, first and foremost, because that's what we all are. The one inevitability of every service member is that they will all be a civilian again one day, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to get out. Can't, can't, can't serve your whole life in the military. 50 years doesn't happen, but every one of us will be a civilian again. So we have to look at ourselves as civilians primarily and first and foremost, and then look at our service as a tool to make us a better civilian. So I say it all the time. Veterans that primarily identify as veterans will never be successful transitioning and assimilating back into civilian culture and life. We have to learn how to empower each other and ourselves to be better civilians because we're veterans. We're not entitled to discounts. We're not entitled to thanks. We're not entitled to pity. Don't be that veteran that walks down and demands respect because you're a veteran. Right. Earn their respect like the, there's nothing better, in, in my opinion, there's nothing more appreciative or exciting for me to have someone I work with be surprised that I was a veteran. You know what I mean? Like I, I love surprising people that I served because that means I was, I impressed them at some point and even more so I'm impressing them because I, I dedicated the amount of my time in my life to serving the country. So empowerment versus entitlement. Think about those words. Think about what your service means to not only you and the people you love, but the people in your community and what you can do to be a better member of that community because you're a veteran. So. Yeah, I love what you said in the beginning there. Um, the war soldier. and I mean, you can interchange that to Marine, sailor. Yeah. The yep. worst sailor, soldier is the best veteran because I mean, we see it nowadays uh, and it seems like it's, we see it more often is like what you just, you just said, the sense of entitlement. Some, some of our uh, veteran, you know, the, the people in our community have, and, you know, and instead of, like you said, using that as a tool they they, they rely heavily on, well, I served, I, I I'm yeah. a veteran, right. You know, so. Well, they expect preferential treatment because they right, served right. they 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 feel entitled to something no like at the end of the day it's a volunteer force which means you volunteered to go do it right. which means you're volunteering volunteering to get out of it most of the time like i i don't think any veteran in the world knows what to say when someone thanks them for their service you know like it's the most awkward thing ever i don't i still don't know what to <laughs> yeah. say you know what i mean like yeah you're welcome bro um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, when you think about that reaction and you think about why it's so awkward for veterans to be thanked for their service, like if you don't feel awkward when someone thanks you for your service, like something like you're coming from the wrong headspace, you know what I mean? Like, right, right, right. Um, I don't want to be thanked for my service because I've processed why I served 
efficiently enough to know that like I don't need things. I did first I volunteered for it. Like yep. um and and second I I really truly feel like I got absolutely everything good from the service, my time in service that I possibly could have. So like in my opinion it was a gift. Like my time in uniform was a gift and one that I volunteered to get, you know what I mean? So I don't need to be thanked for it. Um, you know, if, if someone wants to thank me, I try to send them to fitops.org and say, thank those guys, you know, contribute to fit ops, but mm. it, it's hard. And if, if you're the guy, if you're the guy walking down the street, wearing all that garb, all that, like, thank me for my service outfit. And you're hunting for someone to thank you for your service. You're, you're doing it wrong. Like prove to them that your time in service is worth something to be like worth something to be thankful for. Mm. So be empowered, awesome. not entitled. That's awesome, man. I love what, I love what your, uh, your message is, what you're saying. And for those of you guys just joining in, um, like I said, talking to Harrison Johnson, uh, director of operations for uh, FitOps Foundation. Uh, so Harrison, going into our second segment of the uh, the show here. Uh, so this is this, I ask the same five questions to my guests. I call this the Fast Five. Um, are you ready? Um, let's go. All right. So first question: What's one hobby you enjoy? Uh, wood, not woodworking, but I, I like building things. Uh, and okay. Uh, dim, honestly, I like tearing things down to figure out how they're built and then rebuilding them. Uh, okay. end up hiring a lot of contractors to come fix my job, but it's fun. <laughs> I play some video games here and there too, but don't tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, second question if you had to choose one person, dead or living, to hang out with for one day, who would it be and why? I don't even want to try to start reaching back into dead people because there's a lot of exciting people um, that aren't with us anymore that I'd love to hang out with. But living um, and the nerd side might come out in me right now, but I, I'd love to get in the head of Robert Downey Jr. Now, like mm. I have two little boys, so I end up watching a lot of superhero movies. I always liked Iron Man, but I think my attraction to Robert Downey Jr. as a person was simply like seeing this comeback story where no yeah. one, no one really believed he could, you know, make anything of himself. He was a, you know, a troublemaker, you know, he, he kind of ruined things for himself, got it, you know, gotten to substance abuse problems. And then now he's freaking, you know, Iron Man. So like yeah. that comeback yeah. story is really inspiring. Uh, and you know, I talked to my son about that a lot. He's, he's eight and, um, he loves Iron Man, so it's an inspiring story. So I'd, I'd love to, you know, have have some coffee with him. It, it, it's funny you said that because, um, you know, my mom, um, she she's retired now, but she was a nurse back in in California, and she worked at one of the um, the jails where where he went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, and then and you know, my wife and I actually just are finishing up. Uh, the the Marvel comic universe, the MCU universe movies. So. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, um, I watch a lot of superhero movies, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, next question: recommend a book for our audience to read. Man, um, I you know I I feel like the best book I've ever read was the most recent book I've ever read. Cause you know, you get, you get hyped on a book because you just finished it. And uh, I just recently read relentless. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's, it's Tim Grover. Yep. So it's, yeah. it's uh Jordan's personal trainer. Right. And right. Uh, you know, there's, there's parts of it that I don't, I don't like, but the overall message of being relentless and everything you do, um, I think there's a lot of underlying things and translatable messages within that book. I don't like how he, he basically implied that because of who MJ was, he didn't need a team or, you know, he didn't need anyone but himself. He was the cleaner, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah. cause I'm dang sure that MJ needed all of those people around him to include Tim Gort and Tim Grover in order to be successful. Um, right. but I, I liked that a lot and I got hyped about, 
hyped up about uh, getting to work after reading that book. So, all right, Relentless by Tim Grover. Yeah. Uh, next question: What's your favorite quote and why? I think you mentioned this earlier. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Well, that's not. Um, I, I don't have it, you know, verbatim memorized, but I'll I'll try to paraphrase. Um. There's, there's no greater gift than one can give himself or herself than to commit to the journey that one is on rather than committing to the outcome. And I like that because so many people are focused on, I'll generalize in saying, getting rich, making a lot of money. It's just these dreams of, of the outcome. And, you know, on this journey that I'm on every day is this cool dream that, you know, I never thought I'd, I'd have the opportunity to lead an organization that did something so specifically that I believe was my purpose in life and to do it around people that I love and care about. And, and if, if I was so focused on, you know, the dream, I called it the Taj Mahal, if I was so focused on you know, the, the end state of, you know, talking about fit ops, I would miss how beautiful the journey was and all of the lessons and friendships and the love that comes along with this journey um, and committing to, to the journey and not the outcome. And that quote is, is one of the more me, uh, memorable quotes in my life. That's awesome, man. Um... All right, so one last question here. Where do you see yourself in a year, five years, or even 10 years from now? Damn. I just told you I'm not trying to worry about the outcome, man. Um, <laughs> no. Look, I, you know, in one year, I, you know, I'd, I'd like – in one year, I picture myself spending most of my time out at Camp Fit Ops at the University of Health and Performance and watching – thousands of veterans come through the camp and watching all of the hard work pay off in five years. You know, I can't, I can't even honestly imagine. And I try not to because spending a lot of time in that, that dream world is distracting. But in five years, I, I honestly cannot imagine how, how much growth and where this, this organization will be at. But uh, in five years, that, Camp Fit Ops will host thousands of veterans a year and have multiple verticals, complete accreditation, and, you know, I'll just sit back and enjoy enjoy the fruits of the labor, man, you know, and watching yeah. watching the dream come true. In 10 years, I don't know. I ain't getting that far down the road. <laughs> <laughs> to be determined. Yes. All right. Um Harrison, this has been an awesome episode. Um, love the message that you, you put out for, for our audience. Um, you know, one, one last thing, where, where can they reach you at? Where can they follow and, and support you? Um, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook yeah. and Instagram, Instagram at the Harrison Johnson. Um, but selflessly, I'd, I'd much prefer everyone to go to www.fitops.org and uh, yeah. watch the video, get involved apply if you can or you feel so 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 called to to do so uh you know we're still taking applications but um we will get the doors back open uh just spread the word man and empower each other empower each other to be better empowerment over entitlement absolutely harrison harrison i appreciate the uh the time um and again, the message that you've, you've, uh, you, you put out here, um, you know, stay in touch and uh, let, let us know how we can further assist you and, and, and fit ops and, and, and their mission. Absolutely, brother. I appreciate having me on. All right, brother. Yeah, Take care. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Raiden here. I just want to thank you for listening to our podcast and make sure you guys go check out our website, fortist-fidelis.com. Again, that's fortist-fidelis.com. And learn how you can 
help us support in providing these memorial coins to the families of the fallen. And make sure you guys go follow our social media on Facebook, FRTS, FDLS. Again, that's FRTS, FDLS. And on Instagram and Twitter at FRTS underscore FDLS. Again, that's FRTS underscore FDLS. And make sure you guys go subscribe, review, and leave a comment on our podcast on all the podcast platforms. Till then, take care.